think I'm probably live. Um, hi, my name is Nick Harris. Oh, there I am. Uh, my name is Nick Harris. I'm a co-founder of Berkeley Yeast. Uh, we're a California-based company that sells uh, liquid yeast to the brewing community. Uh, today, I'll be talking about the basics of genetic engineering. Um, and I'm just going to go over uh, just how genetics works and then a little case study uh, of kind of a more complex example of genetic engineering involving yeast that produce terpenes. So yeast uh, depicted on the left here produces quite a number of chemicals or molecules that are relevant uh, that are relevant for brewing. All of these molecules when put together make the complex mixture of beer. On the right here, this is supposed to depict metabolism and metabolism is a wide network of chemical reactions that are each mediated by different enzymes. So each of those nodes on the right describes a different enzymatic reaction, which each of these enzymes will produce a different molecule. So some of these reactions may be familiar to you, such as uh, the consumption of glucose to produce ethanol. And many of these other reactions might be more obscure, but the key thing is, is that each of these reactions is producing a different molecule and each of those molecules is produced by a single enzyme. So we have glucose going to ethanol, but other molecules are produced like isoamyl acetate, different esters, there may be lactones, thiols, you name it. There are thousands of different types of molecules that are produced during fermentation. And um, the way that this works is that each of those enzymes that's producing a different molecule is encoded by a gene. A gene is a snippet of DNA that provides a code for a string of a different uh, a string of amino acids that when pieced together will form an active enzyme. So a, the piece of DNA, a gene is transcribed into RNA. People know a little bit about RNA now with the COVID vaccines. Um, but DNA is turned into RNA and then it's translated into a string of amino acids that then gets folded. And then once it's folded, that enzyme is then in its active form where it can mediate a chemical reaction and produce a different molecule. One more thing to point out is that there's a small snippet of DNA in front of every gene called a promoter. And a promoter dictates the extent to which a gene is turned on or expressed with a stronger promoter, uh, meaning that a gene is going to be uh, turned into RNA more frequently and more enzyme will be made and more of the resulting molecule will be made as well. So let's take a, a deeper dive. All of these genes are uh, contained on the yeast chromosomes and those genes are being expressed into these enzymes. So in the case of uh, making isoamyl acetate, which is the flavor of bananas or, or melon. Um, it's, it's often found in beers where the, the glycol chiller may have malfunction and um, the, the beer is fermented a little bit too hot. In those cases, the ATF1 gene is turned on, it's expressed, turned into an active protein uh, or enzyme. Proteins and enzymes can be used kind of interchangeably for the most part. And that enzyme ATF1 will mediate the condensation of isoamyl uh, alcohol and uh, acetyl-CoA to form isoamyl ester. So that's uh, depicted here with that chemical reaction. Now, what determines how much isoamyl acetate is produced is that promoter. So uh, a weak promoter will result in some amount of ATF1 enzyme being made and some amount of isoamyl acetate made. If you were to switch out that promoter, say with genetic engineering, with genetic engineering, you can make very uh, specific changes to a yeast chromosome. So you can either insert new genes altogether, you can take out genes, or you can do simple promoter swapping. So you can replace a weak promoter with a strong promoter, for instance, so then in the case of isoamyl acetate production, if you switched out the ATF1 gene promoter with a stronger promoter, you would get more ATF1 enzyme and therefore more isoamyl acetate formed and therefore more banana or melon flavor, um, which is depicted on the right. And this is really the, the whole basis of genetic engineering is 
that ability to make very precise changes to either genes or promoters to regulate the timing and extent to which all of these different relevant molecules are produced. So you can imagine uh, this, this could extend to many different things. Um, in the case of beer, uh, beer is already made out of a complex mixture of molecules. Yeast makes a large majority of these. Um, so you have your esters, different thiols, aldehydes, alcohols, um, and yeast is mediating, mediating those reactions. And so by modulating gene expression or by plugging in new genes, you can get uh, different molecules produced in uh, different concentrations, which will then influence beer quality. Some molecules also come from hops, uh, depicted here as linalool and geraniol. Um, those are different terpenes that yeast don't typically produce, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time telling you a story about how we, uh, when we first started the company five years ago, we uh, engineered yeast to produce these terpenes. Um, and so uh, again, they don't typically do this. This involves genetic engineering. So if we take a step back again and, and look at metabolism, uh, off, branched off to the left here is the ergosterol pathway. And even though yeast don't typically mediate this reaction, it's possible to engineer this pathway with new genes, uh, encode new enzymes that are capable of producing little and geraniol. But if you look at the ergosterol pathway, and, and you may be familiar with the ergosterol pathway because uh, this is the whole reason why you aerate uh, the wort at knockout. Ergosterol is important for membrane fluidity. So adding an oxygen into this pathway helps with ergosterol biosynthesis. Um, and if you look at the structures of IPP and DMAP, which are above uh, linal and geraniol right here, they actually look a lot like those final terpenes. And so that's how we knew that we, were, we could potentially engineer yeast to mediate those reactions. This is also the way that many plants do it. So our goal was to produce linalool and geraniol, but we needed to find enzymes to do this. So we went to nature to identify different enzymes that may be capable of mediating those reactions, converting uh, IPP and DMAP into these uh, different terpenes. Um, so we took genes from many different plants and uh, inserted them into the yeast conferring the yeast the ability to potentially produce those terpenes. And so we screened different plant uh, enzymes, specifically a linalool synthase and a geraniol synthase, and found that when those different genes were inserted into the yeast, they had different abilities of producing uh, linalool and geraniol. And so, this is a, a graph, two different graphs showing either linalool production on the left or geraniol production on the right in mix per liter. And on the x-axis, these are different genes coming from different plants. So every single bar is showing a different gene coming from a different plant. And you can see they produce varying levels of these terpenes. And some of that has to do with gene expression, and some of it has to do with how active each of those enzymes will be active in yeast. So not all genes will be able to form an active enzyme when expressed in yeast. So we found through this process that taking a, a, a linalool synthase from mint and a geraniol synthase in basil worked the best. So those were the highest uh, bars in the previous slide. And when you plug this into yeast, uh, these two genes, it confers them the ability to produce linalool and geraniol. What this actually looks like, uh, I know that this might look a little complex, but up top here, uh, the, the, four, um, the four shapes up top to say HMGR, uh, which is, stands for HMG coa reductase, GPP synthase, linalool synthase, and geraniol synthase, those are all genes that were plugged into the yeast. And then down below where you see those little arrows where it says TDH3, CCW12, PGK1, HHF2, those are promoters that vary in strength. And so we piece together different genetic pathways. So each pathway would contain a different promoter and a different gene. So piecing together four genes here, each driven by a different promoter 
to piece together an entire biochemical pathway that would then confer the yeast ability to produce these terpenes. So on the right hand side here, this is a string of DNA containing four genes, each with a different promoter driving gene expression. And the reason there are four genes and not just the two synthases uh, for producing terpenes is because the other two genes um, are upstream in the pathway. So just to go back to the other slide right here, uh, those uh, the HMG coa reductase and the G G GPP synthase are upstream. So this is just a way of opening up the valve a little bit wider. So more flow or more flux through this biochemical pathway to be able to produce more of the final terpene product. So we strung these four genes together, four different promoters driving it. And this would make a single yeast strain that would produce some concentration of terpenes. But it may not be the perfect concentration of terpenes. So in order to really dial in flavor production, you need to try a lot of different uh, biochemical pathway variants to be able to hit a relevant concentration or a desirable concentration of linalool and geraniol uh, in, in the beer. So this is depicting how complex it can get. Up top, you see those four genes. And then down below are uh, listed a bunch of different promoters. And each of those lines is showing a different combination of gene and promoter to be stitched together to form a different biochemical pathway, uh, which is on the right. All of those biochemical pathways each contain one of those four genes and a different promoter driving the expression of each of those genes. And so what that's going to do is, um, and those would each be a yeast strain. So each yeast strain would contain one of those combinations. And so each of those yeast strains would produce a different amount of linalool and geraniol. And so shown on this graph is all of those possibilities. So this is real data. Um, each of these dots right here shows the production of linalool and geraniol by a single yeast strain, which they're producing varying amounts of linalool and geraniol based on the promoter gene combinations that were depicted in the previous slide. And I do want to just point out that um, the y and x axis are both on a log scale. So the difference between, for instance, 0.1 and uh, and, and one is, is tenfold concentration. Um, and if you're wondering if these are even relevant to uh, what beer would typically have, uh, they are indeed. So we took samples from different Sierra Nevada beers and you can see that the yeast is producing relevant concentrations of these two terpenes. So these two terpenes, linalool and geraniol, along with citronella, which the yeast is actually making as well, um, these are the three primary flavor determinants of Cascade hops. And so that's why you see them in uh, Sierra Nevada's beers. And so when you brew yeast, or sorry, when you brew a beer with uh, terpene producing yeast, you can actually get some hoppy flavors uh, just from, even without dry hopping. And so to kind of test that out, uh, we took these different yeast strains and we, through a collaboration with UC Davis and Lagunitas, um, this was almost five years ago at this point, um, we fermented beer with uh, either California ale yeast and then three different engineered yeast strains that are producing different concentrations of those different terpenes. Um, and it turned out with a sensory panel, double, double blind, uh, panel that two of the yeast strains that have the stars above them were significantly perceived as being more hoppy than beer that actually contain hops. Um, I do want to just say that uh, even though they're perceived as being hoppy, um, it's really just a nice floral citrus aroma. Uh, it's not necessarily a direct replacement for hops, but more of just a, an accompanying flavor but if you wanted to make a, a, a pale ale or a blonde ale that has a nice hoppy uh, or, or rather floral citrus flavor, then this is a good yeast strain for doing that. Um, and so I know that that was probably a pretty, uh, pretty complex example and also might be hard to see past how, how this could apply to other things, but 
Um, really, the possibilities are endless. So genetic engineering can be used to, you just saw, produce terpenes. It can be used to produce different uh, tropical flavors, like different thiols or esters. You name it, it's probably possible. So if there's a flavor that you really like, just remember that that flavor is there because of different chemical constituents in the beer, or if it was out of nature, say you really like the flavor of pineapple, well, pineapple tastes like pineapple because of different molecules. And so you could perhaps take different genes from that pineapple, insert them into yeast, which would then confer the yeast the ability to produce those molecules and perhaps create pineapple flavor. Um, genetic engineering can also be used to remove uh, different genes. You can tune um, the production of a wide variety of compounds. So, um, but hopefully this just gives you a nice little taster of what is possible. And uh, with that, uh, I'll take any questions that you might have. I, I figured that there might be more um, questions than, um, uh, so I'll, I'll just leave it to you all to, to ask some now. see so oh there's a question about citronellol because it wasn't one of those two uh, genes that was inserted it turns out that yeast actually have a gene that convert that can convert geraniol into citronellol um, and so that's why it's there so actually if, if you were to dry hop with hops that are rich in geraniol some of that geraniol will be converted to citronella by yeast, even if it's not genetically engineered. Good, good question. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks for having me. Oh, there is one. Does the newly inserted gene stay in the yeast permanently or will the yeast lose it eventually with subsequent divisions? <clears throat> Great question. So the yeast is genetically stable. So when we insert those genes, it turns out that most ale yeast uh, are, uh, have four copies of each chromosome. And so we insert each of those genes onto each copy of those chromosomes. And so the yeast can't kick them out when they're replicating DNA. So you will see the same concentration of terpenes produced with, um, you know, on the first pitch as you would after repitching five to 10 times. Um, there are of course, random mutations that can always occur throughout fermentation. That's why you typically see, uh, you know, as you approach the 10th generation of most pitches that the yeast starts to behave differently. So there's always a chance that there could be a random mutation that occurs in one of these genes, but uh, the mutation rate of the yeast is exactly identical to um, the, the mutation rate of the parental strains. So nothing would change there. Oh, another question about does the yeast, uh, says, does the yeast that's been engineered have the same fermentation kinetics as the yeast that's not engineered? Uh, that's a really good question. So um, in general, all of the yeast strains that, that we make, we, and we've, we've used uh, London ale yeast, Chico ale yeast, uh, a variety of different um, lager strains, and inserting these small snippets of DNA doesn't tend to affect the way that the yeast grows and ferments. And so the yeast will typically only uh, acquire the new traits, but it, they'll still have the same fermentation kinetics, the same uh, uh, flocculation, attenuation, and, and all of that. And so we test the strains thoroughly to make sure that, that that's the case before um, selling them. Uh, another question says, are these yeasts for sale? Um, good question. Uh, the terpene yeast is for sale. Uh, it's called Super Bloom. 
Um, and then there are a variety of other strains that, that we also sell. We have some strains that get rid of diacetyl, uh, some that release large amounts of thiols during fermentation. Thiols tend to be like guava passion fruit flavor. That's, that's definitely our best seller by far is the strain that is releasing thiols. Um, but yeah, check out our website at berkeleyyeast.com and you can see a lot of those different strains or shoot me an email as well at nick at Berkeley East, and I'd be happy to pass on our strain catalog or answer more questions that you might have. All right, uh, we've got another question. Uh, does it require any additional nutrients for the extra process that the yeast do for the added genes? Um, no, no extra nutrients needed. Um, in this case, the yeast is actually producing those terpenes all the way from sugar. So um, there's not a great way of increasing uh, precursor content, for instance. So this would even work if you're making a seltzer. Um, and it's not pulling too much away from, from the yeast metabolically in that you would need to supplement with additional nutrients. So um, you can just treat all of these yeast strains uh, the same way that you would with uh, the parental strains and they, they'll grow identically. So um, I'd say aerate as you normally do, add the same nutrients as you normally do, and um, you don't need to modify the process at all. Good, good question. All right, any, any more questions? Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Um, see y'all later. <laughs>